Welcome to video 1 for week 11. In week 10 we defined eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And I made the statement in that week that eigenvalues and eigenvectors are really, really important in lots of applied mathematics. And I want to give you an example this week. We're going to talk about a whole set of mathematical models called dynamical systems. So what is a dynamical system? Well, it's a sequence of vectors. And the vectors are going to represent the state of the system. And that could be a whole pile of different kinds of things depending on what you're modeling. We're going to see some examples with probability, we're going to see some examples with population, with mathematical biology in future videos. But the system itself is just some sequence of vectors that can represent any kind of state. The sequence is thought of as a value as going forward in time according to a matrix action, so that the next state is a matrix acting on the previous state. So that sort of goes in steps. We think of this as a time step, and that time step could be a second, it could be a day, it could be a year, depending on what you're modeling, but it sort of jumps along in regular intervals with these time steps. The matrix is the same every time. The matrix A is fixed, so that it's the same matrix that goes from time step 1 to time step 2, time step 2 to time step 3, so forth and so on. The system has no memory. It only looks at what the previous VK was, so vk plus 1 doesn't remember any of the other previous ones that went before other than the one directly previous to it. So you can't sort of store information. The evolution of the system only depends on exactly where it is right now. Um, it moves in discrete steps, so this is different from models in calculus that move continuously. So we have a discrete situation for each time step, and then we move on to the next time step. And since, of course, this is a matrix action, this is a linear relationship, so that the state in k plus 1 depends linearly on the previous state. It's possible to have a nonlinear dynamical system as well, but that's a much more complicated thing. The question we often want to ask is what's the long-term behavior of the dynamical system? So let's say we have a dynamical system with a matrix A that describes its evolution over the time steps. And I want to analyze the long-term behavior by talking about eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So let me say I've got an eigenvector and an eigenvalue, and, and say that I happen to be in a state which is an eigenvector. What happens to the behavior of that state? Well, acting with the matrix A is just multiplying by the eigenvalue lambda. That's what the definition of an eigenvector is. So if I, if I act k times, so if I sort of start in, this, in state V, and then I want to know what happens k time steps later, so I go 1, 2, 3, look at the long-term behavior many time steps later, I end up just multiplying by lambda each time, and since the action is linear, that constant comes out each time, and the action still continues to be keep multiplying by this eigenvalue. So in that sense, if I start with an eigenvector, the long-term behavior depends entirely on the eigenvalue, because I'm just taking higher powers of this eigenvalue. Let me be more specific as what kind of behaviors I get with higher powers of that eigenvalue. If the eigenvalue is zero, then immediately after one action, everything is just sent to zero. This is a collapsing state where nothing actually happens at all. The state is sent to zero, and then it just stays at zero forever. If I have lambda to the k times v, and lambda has absolute value less than one, then this term is going to get smaller and smaller. So I take higher and higher powers of something less than one, it gets closer and closer to zero. So that's going to give me an exponential decay situation. So sometimes I'll get exponential decay of the state down to zero. The collapsing state goes to zero immediately in one step. The exponential decay state never actually gets to zero, it just gets there asymptotically. If the eigenvalue is negative one, then taking higher powers of the eigenvalue is just going to f switch back and forth between plus one and minus one. So I get a two period oscillation between a positive state and a negative state. So it's another behavior the system can have is just jumping back and forth between a certain positive and negative state. If lambda is equal to 1, then nothing happens. That's a steady state. And this is really in the same sense that we use the term in calculus. We talked about steady states of differential equations, things that don't change. So if I'm in a certain state and I have a, an eigenvalue of 1, I'm just going to stay in that state. If the eigenvalue is larger than 1, then for the same reason, multiplying something larger than 1 by itself a bunch of times is going to get larger and larger. I'm going to get exponential growth of a multiple of the eigenvector. And lastly, if the eigenvalue is less than negative 1, then in absolute value it's still going to keep growing, but since it's negative, if I multiply by itself a bunch of times, it's going to flip back and forth. 
between negative and positive values. So I'm going to get exponential growth and the same two period oscillation. So I get a bunch of different behaviors depending on what this eigenvalue is. Now that tells me what happens when I start with an eigenvector as the state, but that's not typically where I'm going to start. I could start with any kind of state. So if I have a bunch of eigenvectors, it would be nice if I can write the starting state as a linear combination of the eigenvectors, and it's going to turn out this is often the case. That often the starting state will be exactly this linear combination of eigenvectors. Then the action of the matrix multiple times to look at the long-term behavior will be the action on this linear combination. The action is linear, so it's going to act on this one by multiplying by the first eigenvalue, this one by multiplying the second eigenvalue, so forth and so on. It's just going to act by multiplying each vector by its eigenvalue a bunch of times. So what I'm going to get acting on this starting state is I'm going to get a multiple here, a multiple here, a multiple here. I'm just going to get multiples by the eigenvalue for the different eigenvectors. And then in each of these cases, I can analyze like I did in the previous slide. And maybe this one is exponential growth, and this one is exponential decay, and this one is oscillation. And I can sort of put those things together. Ideally, if only one of them is exponential gro growth and the other ones decay, so say this one is exponential growth and the rest of these decay, then I know that wherever I start, I'm going to end up with long-term behavior that acts like the eigenvalue of v1. And that's sort of the ideal situation. And we actually have some guarantees of ending up in that situation. We have some lovely theorems, and I'm going to spend the rest of this video talking about those theorems that form the, the theoretical background to the examples that I'm going to do in videos 2, 3, and 4 this week. So the theorem is called the perrin frobenius theorem. I'm going to present two versions. This is sort of the, the first uh, lighter version with fewer assumptions. So I'm going to say I have a matrix with non-negative coefficients. So all of the entries of the matrix are either zero or a positive number. This often makes sense for applied mathematics where our coefficients are actually measuring something and all the measurements may be in fact positive. So if I have a matrix that has this, so the only assumption is all non-negative coefficients, then there's actually a largest non-negative eigenvalue. And this is, this is what the theorem tells us. And all other eigenvalues are less than this eigenvalue in absolute value. That means that this eigenvalue is essentially going to dominate all of the other ones. Even if some of these are still exponential growth, they'll be exponential growth at a smaller, at a slower rate. So the largest eigenvalue is really going to control the situation. And that's, that's a really valuable thing for the long-term interpretation of what's going on. This largest non-negative eigenvalue is the, the largest possible growth. If this thing is also exponential decay, then all of the eigenvalues are going to be exponential decay because they're all going to be smaller in absolute value. In addition, the matching eigenvalue has non-negative entries, which again is also important for interpreting the long-term state. So the, the eigenvector is going to be the state that we're going to get to according to this eigenvalue. And if our system happens to be a system that needs non-negative entries, because negative numbers don't make sense for, say, a population value, then it's really nice to know the theorem guarantees that the matching eigenvector for this dominant eigenvalue is in fact a, a, ve a vector with either zeros or positive numbers. Now this is not necessarily ideal since uh, this eigenvalue might not be unique um, and it might have multiple eigenvectors associated to it. So I actually want to, I would like to have a stronger version of this and to get a stronger version of that I need this weird technical definition. So I'm going to define an irreducible matrix. So this is a square matrix, and I want to consider any two indices between 1 and n. So this is a 4 by 4 matrix, then i and j are any numbers between 1 and 4. And I will look, want to look at the ijth entry of a high power of the matrix. So to multiply the matrix by itself. If for any i and j, so for any index between 1 and n, there's some number k for which this is non-zero, then the matrix is irreducible. So if I wanted to look at a 4 by 4 matrix, for example, um, and I had the third column and the second row, this entry here, then maybe this entry starts at 0, maybe in a squared this entry is 0, maybe in a cubed this entry is 0, but maybe in a to the power of 4 this entry is non-zero. If that kind of thing is true for all possible entries, that I can take some power of the matrix such that this entry is non-zero, then the matrix is irreducible. For the systems we're going to analyze, this is, this is going to mean essentially that the system 
all states in the system relate to the other states. You can sort of get between all of the states. The system is actually a, a functional interconnected system. So this is sort of a weird technical definition, but does actually make a lot of sense for a lot of the systems we're going to consider. All right, so now if we add irreducible to the assumptions, we get a much, much nicer theorem. And this is really quite powerful and quite useful for analyzing a dynamical system. So now there is a unique largest positive eigenvalue. So we know there's a largest positive eigenvalue and there's only one of them. All other eigenvalues have strictly smaller absolute value. And that this dominant eigenvalue has only one eigenvector associated with it. Uh, up, up to multiples, of course. So it is a one-dimensional eigenspace, which is really nice. There's a unique eigenvector up to scaling associated with it. And we actually get a nice sort of technical condition about the size of this eigenvalue. If we take the sums of the rows, so A has only zero and positive numbers in it, so we're going to get all positive sums in the rows of A. Possibly zero if one of the rows is all zero. But if we, if we analyze this, if we look at the sums of the rows, then this dominant eigenvalue is bounded above and below by the largest and smallest of these sums. So if, one of the, if the rows sum to 3, uh, 2, and 7, then this thing is going to be at least 2 and at most 7. And that's sort of a nice estimate for what's going on. We can look at the sums of the rows and use that to control the behavior of the eigenvalue. This video has been pretty abstract. I've talked about a whole bunch of theorems for how to analyze these systems. We haven't actually even got into what these systems look like, what are states. I want to start the next video with some more concrete examples. So if this video has seemed a little bit difficult to follow because of the abstraction for it, let's go to the next video and see what we can do with an actual system where we can talk about what the states actually mean.